All right, folks. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, not thankful for Joe mentioning my beard in the chat, um, but otherwise grateful for y'all to be here. Um, so I, I'm Mike Raspoli. I'm the Senior Director of Journalism and Civic Information at Free Press. Uh, this is the Media Power Collaborative Briefing on the California Journalism and Preservation Act and the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. Um, bills that are different, but are similar beyond just name, also kind of in spirit and who benefits from them and what types of policies they would um, implement that could also lead to um, the types of information that isn't necessarily beneficial to our communities. And so we're going to be talking about those bills today. Um, I'm joined by uh, my colleague at Free Press, Amanda Beckham, who's going to be talking about the California Journalism and Preservation Act, um, and a Media Power Collaborative member, and uh, from Public Knowledge, uh, Senior Policy, uh, Lisa McPherson, is going to be talking about the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. But then the uh, the majority of, the con uh, of today is just going to be a conversation, so uh, we encourage folks to share their thoughts, their questions, in the chat, um, we'll we'll start off with kind of like a quick breakout. We, you know, you get a chance to meet and say hi to some other folks of this group, um, and then we'll come back and have the conversation. I'll ask Amanda and Lisa a few questions, but the majority of our time here is just going to really be dedicated to hearing from you all and answering your questions. Um, also, want to introduce uh, my colleague Alex from Free Press. Um, Alex just joined us. Uh, you're going to be seeing and hearing. Uh, a lot of Alex in the upcoming months um, as he comes on board and works on the Media Power Collaborative. Um, okay, cool. All right. Um, well, hopefully you all have water and food if you need it, but feel free to go off camera, move about as you need to. Just make sure you take care of yourself uh, this next hour. Um, if you're on the phone, star nine to raise your hand. If you want to ask any questions or get in the queue or anything, star six to unmute if you're not being heard. Um, and uh, yeah, well, uh, what we're going to do right now, uh, before we get started talking about the bills, uh, we're going to just break out into small groups, just a couple of minutes, just for folks to say hi to other people. And uh, we encourage you to share why you joined today, maybe what questions you have about the bill. And then when we come back, feel free to share those uh, in the chat. Um, so Alex is going to break us up real quick into small groups, and then we'll come back to the to the large group in just a few minutes. All right, room should be open. I think you all just got a little notification to join. So, hey everyone. Um, uh, yeah, hope that was good. Um, we do we've been doing those at the beginning of meetings just so that you know it's not just us talking at the you know virtual front of the room at you all and because we have to do this over Zoom, we don't get a chance to have those small conversations at the table or putting our coats up or grabbing a coffee or whatever. So hope you got a chance to say hi and get connected to some folks. Um, so uh, what we're going to do, um, I'm going to have um, Amanda and Lisa uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, the California Journalism Preservation Act as well as the um, Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. The JCPA is the federal bill. The CJPA is the California bill. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll kind of share a little bit about, you know, what these bills are um, and then open up to, to folks to, to share and ask questions. And, um, you know, I'm not, uh, hold on a second. Okay, cool. Um, so where are... I'm looking, sorry, folks, one second. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, Amanda, hey, how you doing? You're spotlighted for everyone. Hey. Um, um, so, uh, can you just share a little bit about uh, who you are um, and talk a little bit about, you know, what what is the California Journalism and Preservation Act um, and um, what are, you know, some of the some of the concerns that groups like Free Press, Public Knowledge, but also many groups in California have been having with the bill. Yeah, so um, thanks, Mike, for the spotlight and introduction. I'm Amanda Beckham, she, her pronouns. I'm the government relations manager at Free Press. 
um, in D.C., and um, the California Journalism Preservation Act is something we've been tracking closely. It's it was inspired by the um, JCPA that Lisa's going to get to. Um, it's a little different, though. The, the CJPA um, basically would take a certain percentage um, determined through um, an arbitration process of an Internet platform's ad revenue, and it would distribute that money as a journalism usage fee to eligible journalism providers. Um, notably in the bill, there's no requirement that providers, um, journalism uh, providers be located in California. And um, because of, you know, it's really hard to do this in legislation, it can't, it's not really specific about what constitutes news. It's just information about topics of current local, national, or international public interest. Um, Another component about the bill is that um, it requires, and we'll get into um, specifically like our issues with it, it says that in the bill that requires 70% of fees to be spent on um, journalists or support staff. This is one of the sponsors' attempts to um, ensure that the fees go back to journalists, but because of the bill's design and the fact that just in legislation, it's really hard to do this. That's, um, and also it says, and support staff. It's not really um, holding providers accountable to increasing journalist salaries or even maintaining um, a certain number of journalists um, on their staff. Um, there's also in the bill, a provision that creates a private right of action for um eligible journalism providers in the bill um, to basically sue platforms um, for uh, retaliation um, if they refuse to pay like the journalism usage fee. One of our concerns is that um, this could be misused by um, providers who produce content that's sensationalist, misleading, um, harmful hate speech, and um, like I said, since this is modeled on the Federal Journalism um, Competition and Preservation Act, that is something that um, supporters of those kinds of content have been excited about um, with provisions like these. Um, another like main concern is the overall structure of this type of bill um, really disrupts the relationship between um, platforms and publishers where the relationship is symbiotic, um, the low, basically no cost of entry to providers on platforms. I know, um, same questions in the chat, um, really disrupts that and platforms will have an interest to maximize their own profits and reduce their costs, um, which would lead to, um, I know we've heard from Meta outright refusals to just stop posting news content altogether or for small independent publishers to prevent their reach from growing um, using tactics like downranking, deprioritizing, um, and just really disrupting the nature of free exchange of um, ideas on the open internet. And uh, I see questions in the chat. I wanna turn it over to Lisa so we have time to like get to everyone's questions. Thanks, Amanda. Um, as she mentioned, the California bill is modeled in part on the federal one, and as a result, it shares some of the same problems. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Lisa McPherson. I'm a policy analyst at Public Knowledge, and I've spent the last three years advocating against the JCPA, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, our, first of all, the mechanics are a little bit different than in California. The federal bill allows publishers to band together to negotiate collectively with dominant digital platforms for payment for their content. Um, they call it collective bargaining. We don't like to use that language because that's a right that's been hard won by a lot of organizations and we don't think uh, that's what this is. But this idea of negotiating collectively would normally be against the law. This kind of represents an exemption to antitrust law. Some of the challenges that we have it is first, it introduces the idea of payment for access to content. That's a bad idea for a lot of wonky reasons having to do with copyright law, but mostly it's just a dangerous precedent and a slippery slope of having to compensate organizations of any kind for access to content on the internet. 
The bill also allows publishers to withdraw their content from platforms if they don't play ball. And we think, again, that just sets a dangerous idea of access and payment for information that should be broadly available and free. Our second concern is that it's all about theoretically a level playing field and being fair, but the arbitration process, which the federal bill shares, isn't really structured to do that. Platforms and publishers have had these crazy estimates of what the value of news is to platforms and they're miles apart. So the idea that an arbitrator will choose one or the other of those and call it fair just doesn't seem like it really accomplishes what the bill is meant to do. And in the meantime, platforms have to participate. It's not a fair negotiation if one party can't walk away from the table. The third concern we have is exactly the one that Amanda described. There, the retaliation provision in the bill, which says that publishers can sue platforms, means that the platforms will really be restrained from doing their content moderation, which means that some of the most extreme content on the internet will not be able to be moderated. And if there's one thing that will make our information environment worse and more hazardous and more dangerous than it is today, we think it's anything that calls for platforms to do less rather than more content moderation. We also share the concern about where the money goes. Um, Amanda described that in the California bill, it can be for journalists and support staff. Well, in the federal bill, it can be for journalists or pretty much anything to do with distribution or production of news. It could be new AI systems that replace journalism, journalists. It could be new trucks, or it could be rewarding shareholders or making more acquisitions. So we think it will create more rather than less of the consolidation that's been so destructive in the news industry so far. And the last thing is, it's just the wrong tool. We have so many other solutions that we advocate passionately for in this space that are available, but the idea of an antitrust exemption has been proven over and over again in so many industries. To meet might with might, it makes already powerful players even more powerful, and we think more influential over the future of news. So that's my kind of whistle-stop version of, of all the different reasons we just feel like we need uh, great solutions for the crisis in local news, but the JCPA isn't one of them. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda and Lisa, for um, you know for those kind of top line descriptions about about the bills. Um, you know, one one thing I said at the top, which I think is you know important to strike, is that the, you know they are different bills, right? Like ones at the state level, ones at the federal level. There's like different. There's slightly different mechanics about um you know about how to distribute the payments um you know but from our perspective you know at its core they're very similar in the sense that incumbent corporate players tend to um are going to be the ones that primarily benefit and that um if we're determining um you know how to spend money on local news based on the number of clicks something gets or the or the amount of traffic it gets it seems like it's incentivizing all the types of wrong information um, and, and yet, uh, even though we have all these problems with these bills and, and, and not just free press, but no public knowledge, but, um, I know a lot of you on this call who are, you know, journalists or practitioners in this space who, who, you know, who run outlets, uh, who work at small community, nonprofit, whatever it might be, um, that also have concerns with this bill. Um, so Amanda and Lisa, I mean, in, in some ways it might seem obvious to, to, to know the answer to this question, but like, why are we seeing bills like this? Who's, who's, who's pushing them and, and why is it getting so much traction with lawmakers uh, at the state level as well, as well as the federal level? Amanda. So in, Cal oh, yeah. um, in California, it's kind of like a double-edged sword, if that's the right word, because on one hand, the sponsor does have an interest in solving the local journalism crisis. And that's, um, you know, what appears to be um, a sincere interest of hers. However, because of, you know, support from publishers um, and before the latest edition of the bill still might be like, like TV broadcasters, this really isn't the way. Um, and it also comes from, I think, a fundamental misunderstanding of 
why we're in the situation we're in with local journalism, policies that crop up, as Mike said, like existing corporate incumbents, TV broadcasters that are already financially viable, um, you know, hedge fund, um, you know, corporations, like it's not really, it's not going to drive the types of content that are missing. Um, civic issue information, local information, um, information that helps communities in rural areas, non-English speaking communities, um, communities that were never served well by um, our traditional media system. This bills like these aren't going to help that. Um, so that's, that's where it's coming from. I agree. It's a classic good news, bad news story. The good news is there's a growing awareness that democracy is vulnerable and under pressure, under stress, and that local news is a critical pillar in an institution that supports democracy. The bad news is some of the most powerful players in media, most notably the News Media Alliance, have, have created in Australia, they helped write uh, that precedent bill and have now brought it over here and, and have power and influence and money um, to put against it. So good news that we've identified a problem, bad news that some of the most powerful players have taken a leading role in timing, in influence and in money to try to push this particular approach. Yeah, and and Alex raised this as, you know, the theme and some of the comments that we're getting in the chat, but like how much of the bill's momentum comes from this desire to hold big tech accountable? Um, and are there any ways to counter that framing? I think no question the, the idea and the bipartisan effort to rein in big tech is part of what is driving the momentum behind these bills. Ironically, if anything, they serve to strengthen the influence that big tech has over our news environment. So I, th I think there's kind of an irony to that. There's no question about it. So I think we need to maybe point to other solutions that genuinely break down the power of big tech, like more rigorous competition policy, some of the antitrust bills that are out there, and point to them as ways that really and legitimately undermine the dominant platform's business models and break down that power. While we point to alternative solutions, Chris just noted the Local Journalism Sustainability Act as one, um, that, that solve the problem in a way that benefits the types of news organizations that serves communities best. If there's insistent on making you know, Google and Meta pay, okay, but there's alternate mechanisms to do that too. Both free press and public knowledge have come forward with ways to structure independent funds that create um, independent entities that can really understand community needs better to allocate funds that come from the platforms. Yeah, I would say that sentiment is definitely um, alive and well in California, um, very heavily anti-big tech. I do think um, one way to counter that from like an organizing perspective, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later, um, especially in California, I think they need to hear more from people who are directly impacted. Like in one ear, they have, you know, big publishers, and then in the other ear, they have like, you know, Google and Meta, who they don't want to hear from. Um and a lot of communities that are going to be adversely impacted, those that already suffer with, um, you know, discriminatory, um, like, practices by, like, social media and um, the ways algorithms impact those communities, um, they're just not hearing. Um, they're not hearing from independent journalists, small publishers, and that's a really different perspective they need to hear from. Um, because I do think in California, um, and in some cases at the national level, too, they actually do want to do something. It's just that they've got the wrong idea in their heads. Cool. Um, so I, I see some folks have been asking some questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to drop those in. Um, if you prefer to, you know, share it out loud, just raise your hand. Um, we see um, one question from, from Julia. Uh, have any has anyone on the call reached out to directly to authors or sponsors asking them to make changes? Is there a chance to talk to them um, about the bill? Um, can it be amended or fixed, or can it not be? Um, Amanda and Lisa, can you if you want to share a little bit about you know what in lawmaker engagement we've been doing, and then uh, we'll pass it over to Lance, who I know I think spoke to uh, 
Assemblywoman uh, Wicks's office in California. Uh, so Amanda, Lisa, and then we'll go to Lance. So in California, we did have an initial meeting with the bill sponsor and expressed our concerns. Um, we're in the phase now of meeting, trying to meet with some of the um, senators on the California Judiciary Committee. Um, it's, it's uh, sorry, can you repeat the second half of the question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Has anyone reached out and to make changes? Are we, you know, is, is there, could there be a chance to talk about how the bill could be okay. fixed? Um, okay. Um, and yeah, so there have been some amendments to the um, CJPA since it was introduced. The amendments there don't amount to anything substantive. They don't change the overall nature of the bill. The thing is, the overall mechanism of the CJPA just doesn't work. So there's really no, there's not enough amendments that can be done to fix the problematic nature overall. Um, because in general, like this bill, a lot of the funds are going to go to, um, you know, large publishers, financially viable like TV broadcasters, and nothing is going to incentivize them to produce the types of content um, that are that's disappearing. So it's really a process where like this, the bill just needs to be stopped. It's going to do more harm than good. Um, and that's where we are with that. Um, so right now we've, we've had a sign on letter. We submitted an official letter for the record in the assembly and have been um, driving calls to lawmakers offices. And um, yeah, I think we'll probably get a little bit more to our continued actions in California at the end of the meeting. So want to make sure there's time for more questions. Well, my short answer at the federal level is ditto what she said. Um, a lot of passionate advocates have forwarded a lot of ideas, have worked directly with the bill sponsors and authors, and there have been some modest changes made. For example, there's a sentence that has the goal of preserving copyright law, but at the end of the day, we feel exactly the same way Amanda just described, that this is the wrong tool for the job that the inherent nature of an antitrust exemption and a forced arbitration is not the right solution to the problem and holds the risk of making some of our existing problems like consolidation, empowerment of financially motivated owners worse. It, it, it's not the right tool to get at it. And as, as it, much as we'd like to see more changes made, it's gonna round off the edges of what will remain a very sharp object. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Lance, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thanks. I, I think everything Amanda said is completely spot on. Um, I hate to admit Buffy Wicks is my assembly member. I mean, I've, on many, many things, I've, I think she's been a great assembly member. She sincerely wants to help journalism. Um, I think that is, you know, I, I don't think she just wants to find a way to get at Google and Meta, though she does want to do that, but she she cares about journalism. Um, we have the two largest newsrooms in her assembly district. We were the only people, she said to me, who covered her when she first ran for assembly. So she knows what real local news can do. I am mystified at how tigrishly she's held on to the, this very, very flawed approach I pointed her to the rebuild local news sort of menu and saying, you know, look at any of these. These are all better approaches than yours. She really, other than, as Amanda said, a few minor tweaks gave very, very little hearing. Um, I hate to report that Scott Weiner on the Senate Judiciary Committee also says he's supporting the bill, um, which given that the ACLU is opposed to it, surprise me that Wiener felt that way. Um, it is going to help Alden and Chatham and um, Gannett. You know, we will get something out of it because we have very, we have pretty good traffic, but it will incentivize clickbait. Um, it will also be gamed by the big publishers. The Buffy is very, very proud of this. You have to give 70% of the um, funds from this to 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 hire journalists. That's first of all, there's no enforcement mechanism. 
And it's also incredibly gameable. If, if she thinks Alden Capital can't figure out a way to make sure their, you know, their finances are shored up by this rather than, you know, hiring real local journalists, that's an incredibly naive approach. So I'm, I'm afraid this is going to get through. Um, you know, the one thing that people in the know have said to me is if, they can, if the Senate can believe this is in effect a tax, which I think there are decent arguments that it is, um, it will then go to the Senate Budget Committee. Um, my senator is the chair of the Senate Budget Committee, and I think I can get a very, very good hearing there. Um, but, you know, it's sailed through the Assembly. I think it may sail through the Senate as well, which I'm, I, I think is really unfortunate. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Lance. And I and I appreciate you too, like, you know, reaching out to Wix's office and um, you know, probably we'll follow up with you after this call as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's that was generally our sense of it too. Um, you know, we even heard some folks say things like, Oh, like we wish we wish we had talked to more people before we introduced the bill. Um which just feels like a really good reason to to not move ahead with it, <laughs> not feeling like you've spoken to 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 all the relevant stakeholders, um, and and yeah, it's um you know it's it's been frustrating kind of seeing a lot of people have concerns with it, but yet it's just kind of moving along, and so um, but we're hopeful that you know there there's still a little bit of time to make a lot of noise, um, and we'll you know we'll get to some of what those things are in a second. I want to. Uh, someone asked um, in the chat about working with, um, you know, big tech around these issues. Um, I know Amanda and Lisa, you all are kind of, you know, you've been involved in some of the various coalition work. So what, you know, how how have we been working with uh, the platforms on this and and kind of what what are we hearing from their side of things? Um, so in California, it's because of the really strong big anti-big tech sentiment this is like one of the instances where like you know we do you know agree with their analysis it's just that some of their like you know meta's like public statement just before the hearing didn't really do them any favors um so it's kind of where you know we're not opposed to their position like we share the same position it's just that in california their i think their, their voice hasn't been so helpful there um they're like, you know, doing their own lobbying on the bill. I think Meta was in there to try to get um, some of the, like some of the provisions around social, like use on platforms changed. Um, so that was like an amendment that was um, included in the bill, but overall um, it's just, just because of the, the idea um, that all oh, like big tech needs to play, like big tech needs to pay. Um, and that's, um, on both sides. So that's kind of like a bipartisan sentiment in California. So not so much just because they've, they've got it and it's, it's not really helping. Uh, at the federal level, we've met the most and the most often with Google. Meta has been harder to penetrate in terms of just getting an audience to talk about the bill. Um, the challenge is that they're not as, they're not open to talking about anything else either. So what might be a strategy of surfacing alternative ways to structure an inevitable payment, they're not open to that either. So it's hard to go in with a united position on what alternatives could be. So we certainly have a lot of agreement about what the challenges of this approach are, but it, there's been less constructive conversation about how if government after government after government is adopting sort of this public interest obligation of payment, maybe there are ways to do that that could be you know, mutually beneficial. And that, that conversation has not gone very far. Yeah, and um, you know, I saw some folk, uh, I think it was Linda was asking about um, Senator Klobuchar. So she, um, you know, she, so she's been obviously like a big sponsor of the bill. Um, Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about her perspective on this and, and kind of what her reactions have been to some of the concerns raised by groups mm -hmm. like Public Knowledge? Um, the short answer is we've met multiple times directly with Senator Klobuchar's staff. 
uh, each time they tell us that they are listening, that they are open to changes, and then very little changes. Um, ostensibly, that's because as the passionate daughter of a newspaper man, Senator Klobuchar really wants to move something like this forward, has definitely positioned it as part of a bundle of, of ideas to rein in big tech. And I sometimes have the sense that she's sometimes, you know, our staff sometimes then picks up the phone to ask the me News Media Alliance what they think about this particular idea. I can't prove it, but the, the, but the lack of movement on any of the ideas that we and other uh, advocacy groups have brought forward, you know, that, that tends to be the net result, that there, it, it just doesn't change even on some of the most substantive uh, issues with the bill. And frankly, issues with the bill where there's great agreement. So we'll often hear from uh, from the Hill or from other organizations that it, you know it's Google and Facebook and their allies. Well, no, some of these organizations work very actively on platform and tech accountability initiatives. We're not all you know unqualified allies, um, but I but I think they uh, diminish some of our efforts to change the bill by saying that you know we and others are just allies of big tech, which really isn't true. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, yeah, anyone who's kind of seen the work that we've done around like platform accountability, um, you know, can kind of see that it's definitely a strange bedfellow situation. Um, I saw a question from Michelle, um, have journalism organizations such as the Society for Professional Journalists, the Online News Association, and the the local news association, I believe is the NLA. Um, so what, you know, have we been hearing from journalism organizations, um, both, and I, and that might even be a little bit different in, in California versus at the federal level, news leaders associations. Thank you, Chris. Um, so what have, uh, kind of these like professional organizations been, what have, what have they been saying about these bills? So I'd have to check on those specific organizations for California, especially if they're national, if they have local chapters. Um, we did send around a sign-on letter in California that got 14 signatories, uh, majority of them small independent publishers. So that's um, kind of, you know, the for the like small independent publishers, like understand that this bill is not something that's going to help them. Um, and in fact, would make things worse. And that's the prevailing attitude kind of in California is like, oh, like we have to do something and this might not be it, but it's better than nothing. And what they really need to hear is like, it's not better than nothing. In fact, this is way worse than nothing. And the damage it does is going to be really, really hard to undo. Um, but yeah, I can check on those specific groups, but in California, um, journalists and small independent publishers um, share our concerns with the bill. I would say there's the same striation at the federal level. There's large dominant media organizations that advocate for it. There's some wonderful smaller organizations, including some represented on this call that have been amazing partners to us in advocating against it. And then there are some whose members themselves are divided. And so they've taken a neutral position on it. As we strategize about next steps in opposition, there might be power in letters and other advocacy um, coming just from media organizations. Um, so the point can be made that, you know, don't assume that all of media supports these initiatives. So I think there's some power there, but I, I will say that it, you know, it's, it's divided somewhat by scale. Yeah. And, you know, to what, what's been interesting around it, too. And um, hold on one second. I think, um, yeah, like Lance brought this up. So when it comes to the JCPA, like the News Guild is kind of sad in the middle, you know, it one of and, and then in California, they've actually outright endorsed the CJPA. Now, like normally, um, you know, normally be deeply aligned with labor around like a lot of issues around media policy. Um, one of the unfortunate realities is that the majority of journalists that make up labor are inside of, you know, large corporate <laughs> media institutions. And so, uh, you know, their calculus is that if this is a thing that could potentially benefit our journalists and we should be supportive of it, um, you know, obviously I wouldn't agree with that analysis. I think that if, and, you know, and, and, and kind of like, you know, what was said before is even though there might be 
language in the California bill, 70% needs to go towards a certain thing. Um, I don't think it's really good to trust uh, the folks that have really decimated local news and have shown a clear desire to cut every single thing if it means to squeeze profits out of it. And so it's kind of, I think, um, you know, fanciful to assume that this money will will actually go towards where they intended. But that but that language was specifically included to get the guild support in California, as opposed to the JCPA, which doesn't have such an inclusion. Um, other things I would add to um, organizations like Re Rebuild Local News, they were mentioned before, um, allies of free press, we work closely with them. Uh, they unfortunately haven't come out about the JCPA or CJPA either because their coalition is made up of a variety of different publishers and some of which would greatly benefit from this. And so they've also been hamstrung by this bill. Um, and so um, I think it's important, like Lisa said, that uh, the more that we can really amplify folks from the media space, like people on this call about why these bills would be detrimental to our work and to our communities, the better. Um, because um, if 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 these larger kind of big media lobbies have the ears of lawmakers and they're kind of showing like, you know, they're putting this front of like everyone agrees that this is good, um, then then they're going to go along with it. And so, um, you know, one of the things we're going to have to really start doing is trying to to make a lot of noise. And um, we um, I'm going to go to Rashad and just scan if there's any more pressing questions and then we'll share some of the things that we can start doing and, and some other ideas that we have to to beat back these bills. Uh, Rashad, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, so I pretty regularly attend the Rebuild Local News meetings. And my general sense is you're correct that they don't have like a strong stance um, one way or another on the JCPA. And I mean, maybe even slightly favorable. Um, I think because they view it as a net, you know, they're looking at it as it's a net influx. And I don't want to speak for Stephen or anything, but this is just my general impression that, you know, it's a net influx of money into journalism from policy, um, which, you know, aligns with their mission in a sense, right? Which is to like, you know, figure out ways that public money can support local journalism. Uh, and I mean, I think they view criticism of it a little bit as like letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Personally, I'm more on your side, <laughs> you know, on these issues. Um, but I, th I think that's sort of the overall lens with which they're looking at it, um, if that's helpful in the discussion. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm happy to, I don't know, at the next meeting, I can... I'll try to, I don't know, bring up some of these objections, maybe like link to some of the articles that people shared here um, to try to have a more robust discussion. I kind of feel like it's been a little bit on autopilot uh, in terms of the discussions over there, rather than having some like focused discussion of the, the benefits and drawbacks. So um, I, I'm happy to carry some of these discussions into that forum. Yeah, that would be great, Rashad. Thank you. And, we, and we've been working with them in California on a variety of things, too. So we've been in kind of regular conversation with them. Um, I saw that there was uh, maybe something related to what Rashad said that Sanjay raised, and then we'll go to Chris, and then I think we'll probably close. So that'll probably bring us about the hour. Um, Sanjay, you were asking about the kind of the, the harm isn't just these bills will have this like direct impact, but it's at the, they might even stave off or preempt other policy solutions. Um, can you share a little bit more about that? Or you have ideas on on maybe ways to make that case? Yeah, because Maya asked actually a follow-up to that. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it that deeply so much as these things are relatively mutually exclusive and like as far as um, uh, just kind of agenda setting and attention of lawmakers where it would be, you know, like once they pass something like this, they said, oh, well, you know, we did something about the journalism issue, like it's done, like we're not doing, a, you know, a public media reform or scaling Jersey or, or whatever. You know, I mean, the counterfactual is that California is doing this JCPA model right after it passed, a, you know, whatever, $25 million investment in, in local journalism through, through that Berkeley program. Um, and so maybe there is a more, uh, 
fleshed out or sophisticated argument uh, for that case. Yeah, um, and we're also hearing, you know, that there's, you know, I, I think that there's there's clearly a lot of Cal interest in California to address this. We're seeing a few different policy solutions come up. Um, I also have concerns that, you know, there's going to create this thing where some lawmakers who might be in favor of the Berkeley thing don't want to speak out against the, the CJPA because they're fearful that it would in it might inhibit the ability for them to get get more money to it. Um so, you know, I guess there's always those political calculations when you're talking about public funding, but I do think it's kind of interesting seeing how this is playing out in California. Um, Chris, I'm going to go to you, and then I think we're going to wrap, uh, but also know that we're going to follow up with folks as well. But why don't you go ahead, Chris? Yeah, I just, I guess my question is, is for Lisa, who I've been on plenty of these calls with over the last couple of years, um, is there any indication of how this will move at the federal level? Last time the... Uh, JCPA came up for a vote. It was weirdly almost attached to a defense appropriations bill. And that was with like a Congress that was roughly 10 times more functional than the one we have right now, which barely got its act together to save the US from default, uh, which was like super critical in a way that paying, you know, Gannett doesn't seem to rise to like the same level. So, like, is there any, are they going to try a similar trick? This time around, do we have any idea? Because I've just been assuming that this Congress is so dysfunctional that something like this is unlikely to move through it since it can't seem to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, well, when this came up somewhat unexpectedly in this particular Congress, to be honest, at, at the federal level, um, we tried to do some sleuthing on why. It could be just housekeeping. Senator Klobuchar has some staff moving and they might be sort of clearing the decks, you know, moving on in, in different projects. But one but one thing happened at the federal level in the in the committee that didn't happen before. And that is one of the Democrats voted against it um, and vowed to put a hold on it if it came forward without material change. So Senator Padilla who had voted for it in the past in committee said, you've been so unresponsive to the concerns we've expressed that this time I'm flipping my vote and took a very brave choice um, to vote against it at the committee level and vowed to put a hold on it. So that might slow it down. Even if that is overcome and it will require substantive change based on what Senator Padilla and his team have asked for, we also know that it's probably gonna get stopped in the house. Won't, won't even come up because of the very strong positions that have been taken, you know, on that side. So a lot would have to happen for this to keep moving forward. Um, stranger things have happened, but it but it does seem like if they were trying to get poised to move it quickly, it's going to be more challenging to do that than it was on, on its last outing. Um, we're kind of watching though to see if it will once again bet, get bundled with something. You know, they've they've tried to do that before. Well, let's let's do the preliminaries and then attach it to something that's kind of must pass. But to your point, those are harder now. Um, that they, they don't go through as easily as they as they once did. So um, we're going to kind of reconvene in some of our other organization uh, settings, uh, including Rebuild Local News, um, and talk about strategy from here. But it but it has some new obstacles that that it didn't happen on its past times around. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And, I, and Chris, I'm glad you asked that question because I was going to ask Lisa what the status of it was and kind of what the next steps were. So thank you for that. Um, maybe, Amanda, you want to share with folks just where things are in CJPA, and then we can um, begin to share some of the things that we can share everyone and share with everyone in terms of taking action and, and all of that. Why don't you go ahead, Amanda? Yeah. Um, so in California, it did move through the assembly very quickly. Um, it's in the Senate now. And the thing is about it in California, it did have bipartisan support. Um, the thing is, and I can't remember the exact vote breakdown. Some of that is just political, but um, Republicans are also split on the bill in California too. And some Democrats have also raised concerns. So in California, I'd say that support is bipartisan, but so is the opposition. Um, I think more so, even despite some of the concern among the California Democrats, it's political. Um, in general, they try not to hold up each other's bills. This does have a greater chance of stopping in the Senate because the bill, um, I think there's a link to the actual language, is a fairly complex bill. The arbitration process is messy. It's not, it's not neat. 
So if we do have a path to stopping this, it would be in the Senate judiciary. Um, Flesh out some of that. And then, of course, hearing from lawmakers, hearing from their constituents about why specifically they don't like this um, is what's also going to be um, a really powerful message, because right now they're hearing from um, powerful um, corporate lobbyists with a lot of resources on why this is such a good thing. Great. Great. Um, thank you, Amanda and Lisa, uh, so much um, for, for sharing all that, answering people's questions. I really appreciate everyone's engagement and questions on this. Um, what I'm going to do uh, real quick is, hold on, hold on a second. Also take myself off the spotlight. Okay. Um, so in terms of things that folks can do to plug into the work around the JCPA, uh, we're going to share with everyone um, so just like some fact sheets. We're going to share the JCPA research page that public knowledge has put together. Um, we also put together um, a, a letter template for your congressional representatives. If you want to write to them in opposition to the JCPA, we're happy to work with anyone who, who's interested in sending a letter. Uh, we can work with you on that and get that sent. Uh, and Free Press also has a petition that if you want to sign and share around the JCPA. Um, and then with folks in California specifically, um, we have a list um, of things around talking points. We have um, like a, a site that you can just go to, to to call your state senator in opposition of it. Uh, we have a social media toolkit that we'll share uh, for the California thing. And, and again, anyone um, who's either in California or interested in uh, supporting, um, you know, this kind of growing coalition of folks in opposition to the CJPA, um, we're, we're going to reach out to you one-on-one -on -one too, as well. Um, and we're, you know, Lance, uh, you came up before, I know there's a lot of other folks in California that we'll reach out to too, but, um, um, you know, we'll, we've only got a couple of weeks for the CJPA in the, in the Senate in California. Uh, if it clears committee, they think most likely there'll be a, a, some vote on it in September, uh, cause there'll be a break, uh, for, part of July and August. Um, so uh, relatively tight timeline to stop that bill in committee slightly longer in the full Senate, although that might be hard to do. Um, but this is all to say is that the JCPA did not pass last year in Congress because of opposition of people. Um, you know, we heard from from folks in the assembly in California that they're hearing all the noise that people are making, uh, even if, you know, nothing's quite stopping it. So one of the things that we can do that is the most impactful right now is just making noise, contacting lawmakers, sharing things on social media. Um, if you're a publisher or you run an outlet and you want to write something for your outlet, we encourage you to do so. We're happy to work with you on this. Um, but again, we'll we'll share all these different things that folks can do. Um, if there's something else that you that you're interested in doing and taking action against these bills, reach out to us and we can coordinate with you. Um, and, um, yeah, you'll, you'll hear from us soon. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. Thanks again, Amanda and Lisa, um, and uh, appreciate all of you. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll talk soon.